I love to come here, as you may guess. I love to preach here because of your ears to hear and your hearts to obey and a desire for the Word of God. And we're looking at a really uh, wonderful chapter of Scripture today, very practical, very helpful, and I hope you'll take your notes and work through them this morning and uh, have this as a resource uh, the rest of your days, this chapter 20 of Second Chronicles. So if you'll turn there now. What we're going to find is a case study of crisis management. Crisis management, chapter 20 of Second Chronicles. And when you get there, I'm going to ask you to stand together with me. We're going to read the first 13 verses of Second Chronicles chapter 20. And if you're not there yet, just pretend you are. Open your Bible and, and look down at it like you know where you are. Even if you're in Corinthians, that's all right. But this is Chronicles, it's chapter 20, and it begins with this wonderful recollection of a story of a, of a history moment in the life of Judah. Now it came about after this that the sons of Moab and the sons of Ammon, together with some of the Menites, came to make war against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and reported to Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, out of Aram. And behold, they are in Hazion, Tamar, and that is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he turned his attention to seek the Lord. He turned his face to seek the Lord. He he resolved that he was going to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord before the new court. And he said, O Lord, the God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Are you not the ruler of all the kingdoms of the nations? Power and might are in your hand, so that no one can stand against you. Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? They have lived in it and have built you a sanctuary there for your name, saying, should evil come upon us, the sword or judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this house and before you, for your name is in this house, and cry to you in our distress, and you will hear and deliver us. Now behold the sons of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom you did not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt. They turned aside from them and told and did not destroy them. And see how they are rewarding us by coming to drive us out from your possession, which you have given us as an inheritance. O our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless, powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you and all Judah. We're standing before the Lord with their infants, and with their wives, with their children, standing before the Lord. Oh, Father, so many thousands of years ago, your people stood before you, turned their eyes to you, put their hope and their trust in you, No matter what might come, so we today, Lord, we stand before you. Husbands and wives and children, little ones, we stand before you, Lord God. We ask you to speak to our hearts. We ask you to deliver us from the evil one. We ask you, Lord God, to show yourself mighty in our behalf. Whatever crisis has come against anyone in this house, or against this church. May your people be found standing before you, 
seeking your face, holding on to you, and being brought into blessing. This is our prayer, Father, our hope, our desire to know you better, to walk with you closer. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. And you see the crisis. The crisis becomes an unwelcome but necessary motivation to seek the Lord. A crisis has a purpose. God has a plan in a crisis. He has a will that's being unfolded. He he uses it. He, He allows it. And then he uses it in the lives of his people to draw us into his presence, to give us a heart to seek after him. You know, the truth of it is, it's not very often that we seek after the Lord. We don't seek after him as we should. So the Lord God gives us a reason every once in a while, a clear reason why we have to seek after him. He'll give it to us. He continues to do that because his one great desire is to have his children round him at the throne. Round him at the throne daily as you seek him in prayer. And then finally, all of us gathered together. All of us gathered together. And that's his desire. Gather his family together in uh, that final blessing of being with him. And so... A crisis comes, all kinds of crises. I tell you what, we are a country of crisis, aren't we? I mean, there's a border crisis and immigration crisis, and there's government in crisis. Everywhere you turn, crisis. If you don't have a financial crisis now, you just keep listening for a couple of weeks, and here will be another financial crisis. And... Uh, I'll tell you what, and there's always the dreaded midlife crisis. I haven't had that yet, but you can tell me about what that's like. It's when that crisis does come home to us, when it, not just reading it in the paper, but when it's our crisis. that's, That's when the mouth goes dry and the stomach knots up. And you have to face something that is, in fact, it's, it's just unexpected. Usually comes at an unexpected time. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat. Out of the blue, everything had been going great. In fact, it's unexpected in two ways. Not, not that it was just a startling revelation. He wasn't, he wasn't looking to this. The, these people were certain neighbors, and he, he, they had been kind of quiet. The, the nations around about had been quiet for a good while. And so just out of the blue, here, here comes this vast army. The timing of it is often what catches us and startles us and frightens us so much. Uh, it's not just out of the blue, but it's in a, a period of time when you wouldn't Think that such a thing would happen. If you look back in chapter 19 of 2 Chronicles, in verse 4 it says, So Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country. That's from one end of the country to the other. The king leaves Jerusalem. He goes out into the country from one end to the other. And what is he doing? He brought them back to the Lord. The God of their fathers. Uh, this, is a t- this is a time of revival. This is a time of a powerful teaching of the word of God by the king himself and calling people to repent, to turn from their sin. We're going back to the Lord God. And you read further in chapter 19, he appoints godly leaders everywhere he goes. He finds the most godly men to lead the country, places them in positions of authority, warns them that they must rule in the name of the Lord, they must deal justly and righteously. And so it's a time of revival. It is not a time when you expect the enemy to attack, but I want to tell you it often happens this way. Just because you're walking with the Lord, 
Just because you're faithful in the attendance at his house, just because you're giving, just because you're serving, just because you're going to the ends of the earth, as this church does, it doesn't exempt you from crisis. It doesn't exempt the nation. It doesn't exempt you personally. God designs it. It's through his hands. He uses it because he's always pulling us in, pulling us closer. We don't seek him. And so he gives us a reason to seek him. Mm. Unexpected time. And it comes with a dramatic and overwhelming impact. Overwhelming impact. A vast army is coming against you. Look at the names of all those people. Why, it's like if the Arkansites and the Tennesseeites and the Alabamites decided they wanted DeSoto County. And they marched their National Guards against this little old county up here in this corner, this prosperous and peaceful corner of Mississippi. And they just came here to steal, kill, and destroy. And no one was safe. It, it is a vast army that comes up against Judah. Four times in this passage of Scripture, in this chapter, four times, it's, it's called a vast army. So you, you get the picture. This is something that is so overwhelming, it is just impossible to stand against it. It's, it's like trying to build a sandcastle on the seashore and a tsunami is coming. It will not stand. He, he could not see a possibility. It's overwhelming. Have you ever been overwhelmed? Yeah. Hey, I didn't even ask you about crisis. Has anybody here ever had a crisis? M marital, personal, financial, relational, vocational. Anybody here coming out of a crisis? A anybody here right now in one? How many of you know one's coming? It is, it is at times overwhelming. And it's always alarming, always. That uh, gut reaction of fear. That vast army, if it doesn't inspire fear, I don't know what will. If it doesn't inspire fear, then you're missing something in your, in your being. Because God puts that alarm in us. I like what one of the other translations says, alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved. It's, it's the alarm that calls us into action. It's the alarm that is that God built in peace of us that looks at a situation and sees the, the vastness of it, the size of it, and that understands that uh, despite my walking with the Lord, he's allowed this into my life. And he's going to use it. But I'm scared. I'm scared. My first reaction is fear, alarm. I tell you, we had a little crisis at our house a few weeks ago. I, we had a terrible windstorm during the night. We live out on an exposed hill, and it was just like every direction. The wind was just knocking at that house and shaking it. It was a, it was a really fierce wind. We, we went on to bed and pulled up the covers, slept through it, woke up the next morning. I did, got up first to fix coffee as I usually do, but the electricity's off. It was off in, in the, the living room. You know, you turn it off and on just to make sure, and you go to the kitchen, and you turn it off and on in the kitchen, and, and, and it's off everywhere. No matter how many times you flip the switch, that's going to stay off. And so we were dead in the water out there, and I... I I, I'm the one who makes coffee first thing in the morning. So I looked at the coffee maker, and it wasn't going anywhere. It was making nothing. And so I, I started in a little bit of panic, and I was thinking, how, how, we don't have any other way to make coffee. It's all electric in there. <coughs> so I, I remembered I had an AC-DC converter in my truck. So I ran down and turned on the truck, and then I rem I've got to get some ca cable, enough cable to get from the truck to the kitchen. So I, I ran downstairs, and I was reaching back there in the closet, and I was trying to find a 50-foot length of cable, so I 
I found one, put it on my shoulder, ran out to the truck, plucked that in, ran up, ran up the stairs in the deck, and opened the kitchen door and ran that plug in. And I, I just felt so good. I plugged that coffee maker in. I thought, oh, coffee, coffee's coming. <laughs> Nothing happened. It started just blinking lights and, and like saying, leave me alone, leave me alone. Danger, danger. So I unplugged the thing, ran downstairs, and Marcia, you got to wake up. we got to get out of here. I said, there's no coffee in this house. We're not getting any coffee. And she, she did. She jumped out of bed. She got dressed. We jumped in that truck, and we drove 45 minutes to the nearest McDonald's. <laughs> you know, so, sometimes we are, we are such a funny people. That, that's called a first world crisis. That's not what the rest of the world is going through. And a, a lot of times we just dramatize every little issue in our life, and, and we blow it up ourselves, and, and we make more of it than it really is, and we're the drama kings and drama queens of, of life, but every once in a while there's something so real and so overwhelming and, and so painful that, that all we can do, listen, all we can do is begin to seek the Lord, seek the Lord, and being prepared for that, being prepared to seek Him is such I, I believe that's what we need to hear this morning from God is be prepared to seek after me. Jehoshaphat sought the Lord. This word seek is such a cool word. In Hebrew, it means to trample down. To trample down. Trample down what? It's like uh, literally is when somebody was making a path, a regular path where they, they trampled down. You, you've seen it around your yard, around the house, or, may, or maybe on a path that you taken the woods. It's where it's trampled down because it's, it's used, right? He, he trampled down a path to the Lord. He, he made his way to the Lord. It wasn't the first time. He, he had made a path to the Lord. You look back in Scripture just at chapter 17. And look at chap- verse 3 about This man Jehoshaphat, the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he followed the example of his father. His father David's earlier day, chapter 17, verse 3. He did not seek the Baals, but here he trampled a path. He sought the God of his fathers, followed his commandments, and did not act as Israel did. You see that? He already had a path. He, he already had a pattern in his life of seeking after the Lord. It's, it's not a matter of waiting till a crisis. It's a matter of a Sunday like this, in the house of God like this, where the people of God determine that we as the people of God, we're going to beat a path to the Lord. We're going to be a people of prayer. We're going to pray and we're, in the, we're going to seek His face. So that when you're standing out there alone, when the crisis comes, when the mouth goes dry, when the stomach knots up, you, you have a place to go. Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat resolved to seek the Lord. You see, it's the time between those two things, the being afraid and the resolving to seek. The shorter you make that time, the more practice you are, and seeking after the Lord, the sooner you get in on His side in the issue, the sooner you feel His peace and His strength and His power. If you just hang out in the fear, if you just stay there afraid and you don't, you don't know to seek after Him, you don't know how to fall on your face before Him, you don't know how to pray, you're not in the practice of praying, you're just going to stay there in the grip of fear. And what the Lord wants to do is just to take that fear and take hold of you as you take hold of Him and hold you in His peace. I mean, this is, you know this is the truth throughout the Word of God. I, I can tell you story after story from this book of how God's people are up against a wall. And, then, and they get there because they don't call on Him. And so He gives them a reason to call and to seek, and when they do, he hears. 
It wasn't just Jehoshaphat. Look at the beauty of the story. This picture of Judah, the people, this, this tribe that had inhabited the southern portion of Israel under King Jehoshaphat. It says they gathered together, verse 4, to seek help from the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah. Oh, that word spread fast. We're in trouble. So they all headed to the house of God. They all knew where they're going to find their help. Does any, I, you know, I, I find this amazing that uh, most of you in this room under 30 don't remember these days. But there was a day in September. There was a day in September when our, our world just seemed like, what's going to happen to our country? And we got through that morning. The word went everywhere, didn't it? Everywhere. We all knew in the grocery stores, the gas station, schools. We all knew. But do you remember? I wonder if it was your experience also. Wednesday night, September the 12th, 2001. You know what it was like in our church over in Arkansas that night? When prayer meeting was usually a handful of people who sat in one corner, and I, I would take one of these music stands, and I'd, I'd lead the prayer meeting from right here on a Wednesday night in that church with a huge balcony that sat 1,500 people. You know what happened that night? It looked like Easter Sunday. You couldn't find a place to sit. You know, people were crowded around the balcony. They were crowded along the sides. They stood in the back. Every seat was filled on September the 12th, 2001. Because the people of God realized it was time to seek the Lord. Train, train your heart. Train your heart. Here's, here's my fear. What's my response time? Where am I going to go? You know, the problem with us guys is <laughs> the first thing we say, you know, we're scared, but we're not going to let anybody see it. So we say, I got this. I can fix this. Come on, this is nothing. I, I got it. I got it. And then you, you walk out of the room and say, my, why, why did I say that? <laughs> why did I say that? It, it, is, it is a great male problem that we cannot ever get to that point where we we say, you know, I'm just going to take this knot in my stomach and I'm going to just take it over and I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to call on the, the God who made me and bought me with his blood and saved me and has a plan for my life and for my family's life. And family, we're going to pray. We're gonna, the first thing we're going to do, maybe it's not the last thing, but the first thing we're going to do is pray. And there'd be men like that. Out of this church, young men, old men, grandpas, daddies, single guys, wherever you are, men who would take a stand. And we are going to seek the Lord. And what happens is that this desire from Judah and from Jehoshaphat becomes a school of prayer for the people of God. A crisis becomes a school of prayer. That's where you're really going to learn how to pray. You don't learn it just in a Sunday school class. You learn it when the experiences of life press you onto the heart of God and you have nowhere else to go. That's where you learn stuff. You know, but, but we Baptists, we just train and train and learn and learn. We never graduate, but we, we keep on going back to learn. And the fact is, you never learn it till you're hurting. Until you need him so bad, you just don't have any other place to turn. You, you need the Lord, and you seek his face. It's a school of prayer for the people of God. All the men of Judah, their little ones and their children, their little ones, they stood there before the Lord. In the school of prayer, we learn to count on God's omnipotence. Look how this great king prays and leads his people, people in prayer. Oh, Lord, the God of our fathers... Are you not God in the heavens? Are you not ruler over the kingdoms and the nations? Power and might are in your hand so that no one can stand against you. He, be, he begins to count on God. It's like he holds his fingers up and says, Number one, this is what we know. Our God is omnipotent. He rules and he reigns. 
Heaven overrules earth. He who sits on the throne of heaven can say, not any farther. And, you, and that kingdom can't take a step. He who sits on the throne of heaven says, no more. And it is no more. Oh God, are you not omnipotent? Are you not sovereign over the nations? All the kingdoms of this world, power and might are in your hands, so no one can stand against you. You know, when I was a little kid in Florida growing up, you know what we, we had to do is probably like once a week, and sometimes uh, with films and, and visits, we had to prepare for nuclear war. <laughs> you know what they told us to do? Duck and cover. Get under your little wooden desk and cover your little red head and you're going to be okay. And I believed it. And we, we were afraid of, of this ominous power. This ominous power of the Soviet Union. And their rockets. And their ability to destroy us. But you know what? One day God said, you're not going to do that anymore. And he brought down an empire. He brought it down. Marsh and I went out to the Czech Republic. You know what those people did? They had a, one of the hardest uh, communist governments in Eastern Europe. People got up there and they shook their keys. And they said, unlock the doors. We want to be free. Never fired a shot. And the government collapsed. And atheism all over Central Europe and in and the Soviet Union, official, legalistic, harsh atheism just took a nosedive that day because of our God. It wasn't armies. It was our God. Omnipotent. Not only is he omnipotent, but they count on his faithfulness. Did you not, O oh, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people, Israel, and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Oh, how faithful God is. And count on his omnipotence. We count on his faithfulness. He's been in the business of saving his people for a long, long time. Brought them out of Egypt. Brought them through the wilderness. Brought them across the Jordan. Brought them into the land of promise. Didn't you promise? Oh, Lord, you're faithful. You're faithful. You're faithful. Now, some years ago in our little church out in that northwest corner of uh, Tennessee. I guess it's that direction somewhere. Just a little country church, full of good people, really good, decent people. The issue was out where we were, they were good, decent people everywhere. They didn't even go to church, and they were lost, and they were as good and decent as everybody else. It was just a good, decent place to live. And it was an ordinary little country church. But, but one evening after a Sunday evening service, I had some men come to me and said, Pastor, there's got to be more than just being ordinary, good people. Uh, we we want to meet the Lord in a personal way. We want to experience Him here in our worship, and we hunger for that. There's three, three or four guys, a hog farmer, a uh, soybean farmer, a milkman, and a refrigerator repairman, refri refrigeration, and... Uh, I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm with you. What do, we, what do you want to do? And they said, we want to pray. When, when can we pray? I said, and they told me, uh, what we have in mind is we'll come Saturday night after we put the kids to bed about 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. As, as my son will verify now, on 9 o'clock on a Saturday night, I want to be in my bed <laughs> and getting ready for Sunday and sleeping and rest, and they wanted to start praying at 9 o'clock on a Saturday night. I said, gee, oh, well, come on, Pastor. Okay, I'll be there. So I went there, and those, those four or five guys, they came up there on that platform, that little country church, and they, they stretched out across the platform. You know, here's the milkman, here's the hog farmer, and here's the refrigerator pan man, and here's the soybean farmer, and here's a, a mailman, and they're all laying down on the ground. And I, I'm stretched out there with him. We start calling on God and seeking his face to come, Lord. Come and invade our church. Come be present with us. We don't want to just learn about you. We want you. We don't want to just talk about you. We want to experience you in our, in our 
midst in our worship. And we started praying like that. And prayed and prayed. Nothing happened. Nothing seemed to change. We prayed Saturday night after Saturday night after Saturday night. One Sunday night, months into that, with no visible change, there, there was a, a couple who had been coming for a few weeks, and they, they just sat over here to my left from the pulpit, and they, they sat there every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, never said a word. I asked about them, uh, J.C. in Virginia, and someone told me they had lost a son tragically, and they have never recovered, so, but they, they were sitting there Sunday after Sunday, so this one Sunday night, as I closed out the service, it just occurred to me, does anybody have something they want to share? And of the people in that Sunday night service, here stands Virginia, this quiet, quiet woman. And she says, I need to tell you what's happened to me and my husband. We had a son, our only son. He drowned in a quarry swimming with some other teenagers from the community. She said, it was always unclear how he drowned. None of the boys would ever tell the circumstances. And it became clear to us that they had been just goofing off, holding each other down. And they held our son down until he drowned. And she said, every day I stand at my kitchen sink, and those boys walk past my kitchen window on their way to school. Day after day, she said, I stood there at that sink, and I began to hate them. I was filled with anger and bitterness, so angry and so bitter that my husband, J.C., could not live with me, and we divorced. But we found out in the weeks that followed that we couldn't live together, but we could not live apart. And so he came back home, and we remarried, and we went to the doctor. And she said, we had a coffee table full of medication to control our nerves and our thinking and our, our hearts. It was all laid out. On. She said, one Saturday night, one Saturday night, a few weeks ago on a Saturday night, I looked at all that medication, she said, and I just swept it off the table and said, J.C., tomorrow we're going to church. And then she stood up and said to all of us, and I want you to know in the weeks that we've been coming here, God has been touching our heart and healing our heart. And she said, I want you to know I forgive those boys. My heart is healed. Know my son is in glory. And one day we'll be with him. Oh, when she sat down after that, there was a quiet over that church. You couldn't believe. I prayed. said, let's sing a closing song. And we sang, gave the benediction. I looked up. No one had left. Everybody was still sitting right where they were. So I said, well, does anybody else have something to share? From another corner of the church, someone stood up and shared how God had been working in their marriage. And somebody shared how God had been working in the life of a child who had walked far from God. And uh, Testimonies, testimonies. And, and finally, when that quieted down, I said, you know, great, Sunday night, it's getting late. It's get, it is getting late. we got to go home. <laughs> got to go home. I prayed. I looked up. No one had moved. I said, you still have something to say. If you have something to say, let, uh, and again, people started sharing this. Country church where we had done ordinary church, ordinarily, for so many Sundays, and, and God just came and visited that congregation, and we felt his presence. That, that happened three times I tried to get them to go home. Finally, I said, you've got to go home. You've got school in the morning, you've got work, you cannot stay at church all night, go home. And prayed, and they started going. In those days, the preacher had to pick up behind everybody, so I'm going by and getting bulletins and putting hymnals back in the rack, and somebody runs back in and says, Brother Bob, come out and see what's happening. See what's happening. I thought a fight had broken out out there, but <laughs> I come out the door. You know, the church, the people of God, 
and had never gotten in a car. They were huddled in, in huddles all over that front yard of that churchyard over there in Woodland Mills, Tennessee. And they were praying for each other and holding on to each other and ministering to each other, encouraging one another. And it, it was the, chur- the church. That's, that's what it was in the beginning. And that's what God wants to make it when God's people will seek his face. He's faithful. He's in the business of being faithful. What he's done in the past, he'll do now. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, he keeps his promises. There's a promise right here. Verse 9, should evil come upon us. All, and the sword or judgment of pestilence will stand before you in this house. You see, that's in quotes, verse 9 is, because that's a promise that was made by Solomon to the Lord. When trouble comes, we're going to come here and pray. People of God covenanted, come and pray. And God in response said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. I'll heal their land. This sick, sick country. Sin sick. There's got to be a people somewhere who who understand the nature of this crisis Mm -hmm. of a society in free fall, away from God. But there's a people who see the crisis, and though it's overwhelming, they know where to go. They come before the Lord, and they pray, and they seek his face. (laughs) What do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, you count on the omnipotence of God. You count on the faithfulness of God. In the school of prayer, we learn to count on God's promises. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. In the school of prayer, we learn what to do when we don't know what to do. Somebody said Jehoshaphat was like a dog on the interstate. A dog on the interstate. We have no power. (laughs) And I don't know what to do. But my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. My eyes are on you. Listen. Took his eyes off the vast army. He put them on the Lord. Peter took his eyes off the waves as he was sinking. He put them back on Jesus and said, help me. And Jesus reached lifted him up the thief on the cross he couldn't do a thing he was just nailed but he could turn his head and he could look to Jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom I will lift up my eyes to the hills my help cometh from the Lord the Lord who made heaven and earth He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.